So, Frostbite Book 1 is over, and I'm sure the most of you that know about our first series, Sign On, is in no doubt high anticipation for Season 2. But what about those of you who don't know about Sign On, or don't feel like sitting through the rough beginning of BCP? Well, you're in luck, because in this video, I'm going to explain everything you need to know about Sign On Season 1. Which is a lot, so try to keep up. S-Y-N-A-W. Sorry you're not a winner. Popular song by British metal band Enter Shikari and the odd title chosen by myself, Ty Coker, and BCP co-founder Colin Hoppy while constructing our first series on a composition notebook in my bedroom. That's not important. A title so long that it's simply known as its abbreviated title, forcing any and all to make up their own pronunciation, though I prefer sign off. The primary story is about young Lance Green, a private in the UNSC. Not meaning this is in the Halo universe, I simply use UNSC as my military name in Halo Machinima to explain why it says UNSC on everything. Besides, the UNSC might as well be the US Army in this story. Not to be biased, international viewers, but, but besides, it takes place in Africa. Kind of like Halo. None of this is important! I'm supposed to get to the important stuff, and I. Can you stop bothering me about that, please? Anyways, the story is about Lance Green. Well, mostly. The story is really about every character that has a name, but Lance seems to be the center of attention for all the other characters, so we'll label him the main character, Woo Goo. Lance is part of Oni Squad 114, a squad that consists of Lance, the young private, and ranking F and G, Sergeant Scott McKinnon, the commanding officer that seems to like to change ridiculous voices a lot, and Corporal James Phillips, McKinnon's right-hand man that always seems to have a sniper with him but never uses it. Not like Red vs. Blue, okay, I'll explain in a second. The team is stationed to guard a supply outpost in the African War Zone, where they are ambushed by a terrorist group called the Nordak Alliance, led by Stephen Connors. Does he look evil? Good. We'll get to him in a second. Lance is knocked out during the battle and has a vision of a glowing man standing in the sky and has a short-lived conversation about how he was in an ancient land and he was guided there by the spirit Sam. Sound weird? Well, that is our jumping off point. When Lance wakes up, he's plunged right into the firefight in a first-person battle sequence where another member of Squad 114, Isaac Strafford, is killed and McKinnon gives Lance his assault rifle. That doesn't seem important, but it will be. The firefight goes haywire when a strange, roaring monster shows up, a monster that's never actually seen or heard of after this sequence. Lance, McKinney, and Phillips escape the outpost through the sewer system and report back to their commanding commanding officer, who at this point's name is Commander. See that marathon logo? Yeah, that's important. Commander and McKinnon have a contest to see who can do the most ridiculous military voice while Lance drifts off and talks to himself, questioning his vision when a naval intelligence officer hears his mumbling and requests to speak with Lance alone. It turns out Lance isn't the only one that had this vision. There were three others that soon after having the vision killed themselves or was killed by that unseen monster. Naval intelligence officer requests that Lance comes with him, commander says he already has a mission for him, guns are pointing at each other in an unclear chain of command, and commander wins. Back at Outpost 114, Stephen Connors, sporting an almost western accent, is on the search for an artifact called the Genesis. See that marathon logo? Oh, and he talks angrily to himself about someone named Jameson. It turns out that the mission for Squad 114 is to return back to the outpost and retrieve the artifact that Connors men are searching for. On the way there, they run into some trouble, but it would appear that the naval intelligence officers are silently watching over them. They sneak into the base unheard, but Lance notices a strange, well, thing on the ground that wasn't there before. Guess what? That's important. McKinney and Phillips crack open a safe while Lance surveys the area. Once the artifact is revealed, Lance has another vision of himself in the future, and Connors ambushes McKinney and Phillips in the safe room. Luckily, Lance wasn't there to get caught and escapes with the naval intelligence. His name is Daniel Griffin, okay? I'm tired of saying naval intelligence already. So Scott and Phillips are captured by Connors and presumed to be dead while Lance teams up with the naval intelligence team to search the African desert for clues about the spirit sand. They pass through some dig sites, including one with a stone structure that no laser can penetrate, and a temple mostly excavated with the entire dig crew killed. They enter the temple to find three ghosts slash spirits that call themselves the Prophets. Could these be the three other people that had the vision that died? Huh? Huh? The Prophets go on a rant calling Lance the Phoenix, take him away, and then give him a special armor they created that oddly matches Griffin and the other officer who doesn't have a name. Meanwhile, at the Nordak base of operations, McKinnon and Phillips awake in a holding cell with the well-guarded Genesis in the room. This is where we also meet Captain Miller, a scientist in what looks like medic armor that's helping Connors decode the Genesis. But alas, Connors becomes impatient with unpowerness and tries to activate it himself, 
he ends up shooting it and making it turn red. Oh fucking no. Right? Clarence has a short flashback mentioning the key of light. Where is the key of light? And remembers that he has to have a key to activate it. It turns out that the key is in a crashed alien vessel called the Key Holder Scout Ship. A crash land next to the temple and Lance, Daniel, and Third Wheel recover it. Suddenly, Griffin is summoned back to DC on unexplained matters by General Eisenberg, and he decides to take Lance with him. Before they leave, they decide to check on the Prophets, who appear to be ranting about how the end is near. Oh, did I forget to mention that the Prophet said that if the Genesis, which they call the Beacon of Light, is activated without the key, it will bring a great curse to the planet? Yeah. Oh, fucking no. Oh, and on the way, they discover the centerpiece is missing from the impenetrable stone structure. That's important. Back behind enemy lines, Connors is interrogating McKinney and Phillips, thinking that they know where the key is. When they don't, Connors goes to attack their HQ in search of it, leaving them alone with Miller, which turns out to be a bad idea once McKinney reminds him who's boss and goes to find their weapons, leaving Phillips alone to interrogate Miller about the monster that killed their squad. After learning that they had nothing to do with the monster, the two go to get the Genesis when they're ambushed, but saved by none other than Miller, the guy that they beat senseless not five minutes ago. So the two escape with the Genesis and head back to HQ. At DC, Daniel and Lance find that a rogue satellite picked up an image of an alien vessel heading towards Earth. It turns out the Genesis slash beacon of light belongs to an alien race, and when it's activated without a key, it sends a distress call to the aliens, and they're on their way to take it back. But vacation's over once Lance gets a radio call from his commander in Africa, who we now learn is Rick Jameson. Yes, THE Jameson. Meaning the one the bad guy seems so intent on getting revenge on over something to do with the Genesis. He tells Lance that Connors is attacking their HQ and he's held up in his quarters, so Lance and Daniel head back to help. See a pattern here? Everyone's heading to the same place. Not only that, but it would appear that the aliens have arrived and they send out a lone scout that ends up crossing roads with Lance and Griffin, recognizes Lance as the Phoenix and goes after him. Here's where things get spicy. Back on the alien cruiser, a lone Xeno named Karth speaks out towards their leader about the use of the beacon. Apparently it was made to bring about galactic peace, not the end of humanity. Sadly, his small rebellion is crushed under the mighty foot of alien justice and yada 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 EARTH! Back on Earth, Lance, Griffin, and No Name rush in to take back their HQ and kill most of Connor's men. Griffin and No Name go around to check out the Hornet Bay while Lance rushes through the battle to save Jameson. But something strange happens. He runs into this. Look familiar? Luckily, they're very fragile, and Lance Falcon pu I mean, Phoenix punches it into oblivion. But then he runs into this guy. But don't fret, Jameson is here to save the day. Jameson explains the situation to Lance about how Connors wants to fight him one-on-one -on -one and he won't leave until that happens. Then they're greeted by two old friends that also found their way to HQ. Hooray! Happy reunion! So now they have both the Genesis and the Key, so Jameson orders them to go back to DC pronto and goes to fight Connors mano a mano as a distraction. Why do they both have swords? We'll have an educated guess in a second. On the way back to DC, McKinnon and Phillips tell Lance the strange background between Connors and Jameson in a three-act flashback sequence that is ultimately my favorite part of the series. It turns out that Connors and Jameson were two special operations soldiers in a war against Russia over 100 years ago. Not only that, but Connors was Jameson's commanding officer. Together, the two single-handedly blow up the center of Russian intelligence and are awarded for this magnificent achievement by being placed in Project Eska. Well, not placed in it, they're forced into it. Project Eska turns out to be an operation of cryogenically freezing competent soldiers until they can develop the technology to create super soldiers. Yes, this is where the Spartan type people come in. Connors and Jameson are frozen and wake up several years in the future where some failed experiments caused an outbreak that made all the scientists go mad. And a soldier, whose name I won't say you get to watch the series if you're going to get this easter egg, comes to rescue them but is taken down by the cold fist of SCIENCE! Connors and Jameson escape the facility and are summoned by Captain McCoy, the latest contender in the Ridiculous Voice competition. They go to guard a radio tower that's trying to contact an alien planet about some sort of weapon, and they are attacked by a group of rebels that think contacting them is a terrible, terrible idea, and goddammit, they're right. So Connors and Jameson retreat after the radio tower controls explode and kill everyone inside. Connors and Jameson, being the only successful super soldiers, are put in Operation Marathon and get shiny new armor. Their mission is to go and get a weapon of mass destruction from an alien planet. Yes, that weapon of mass destruction. 
They arrive on the planet, the team splits up, Jameson has a moment with Karth and they both see the vision, Carnage overhears the conversation about the key, Jameson finds the Genesis, McCoy gets sucked into a vortex which alerts the aliens so Carnage makes a run for it, and even though Jameson has the Genesis, he leaves him behind, flies to their ship and forces the pilot to abandon everyone else that's fighting to distract the air defenses. Luckily, Jameson is a fast learner who takes an alien ship all the way back to Earth. Back home, Connors is greeted by General Eisenberg and Chairman Hill who is going to return McCoy's sword. You know, sort of like the sword that Connors is always wearing in the future. Connors lies and says that everyone died, he was the only survivor, but Jameson, arriving fast and be late, tells them what really happened. Connors is sentenced to be executed and Jameson continues to serve in the UNSC. But let's focus on the execution, shall we? Connors requests to be blown up. Strange, right? Well, it's my fucking tax money, I want to see some guts. So the executioner starts to set up the explosives when Connors somehow got a gun, forces him to switch armors with him, and leaves him to die, and disappears into the African war zone. Ready for the finale? Me fucking too. Back in the future at DC, Old Squad 114 finds that the aliens beat them there. McKinnon and Phillips go to distract the aliens while Lance goes up to save Eisenberg from the alien leader, who learned that Lance was headed to DC from a group of soldiers at the Prophet's Temple. Oh, and he left a poor alien behind. That's... not important at all, actually. ANYWAYS! Back at Africa HQ, Connors and Jameson battle it out until they find the aliens overran their base while they weren't paying attention, and they have to work together to fight the aliens once more, with a little additional help from Karth and his laser rocket launcher. They win, Karth fights the assassin that was after Lance, who survived the gunshot wound, and Connors takes him out. Back at DC, Phillips has a flashback of him and Stratford the day that their base was attacked. Yeah, that Stratford. Turns out Phillips isn't a sniper, Stratford was the sniper, and he noticed that Lance was down, went to help him, and left the sniper with Phillips. So Lance got his rifle and Phillips got his sniper, can you see the connection now? And it turns out the thing that Phillips was shooting at in the first episode was a lone alien planting a camera. Yeah, these are alien cameras, apparently to look for the Genesis on whatever planet they'd end up on. During the fight in the real world, McKinnon gets shot and Phillips goes to help Lance who gives the alien the Genesis to get him away from Eisenberg. Then he jumps off the base with the key. OH MY GOD DID HE DIE?! No silly, he just met up with Griffin who took one of the Hornets from HQ, remember? No? Did I not tell you that was gonna be important? No? Well I can't tell you everything! For some reason Phillips does think that Lance died though and Rage kills the alien leader and gets the Genesis back. Then, after they take Sarge to the infirmary, the Prophets spill out some nonsense about prophecy and vengeance, and it's over. This is easily the single most complex plot I have ever read, so I hope that this has cleared up some things for you. If not, go watch the damn series.